as we saw in the last lecture, the revolutions of 1848 in Italy uh, marked a kind of a turning point. Many historians have seen this as the culmination of the growing desire on the part of the Italians to be unified. There is, in a way, a development of national consciousness uh, through the first half of the 19th century, particularly since the time of Napoleonic reorganization of Italy. There were many who did desire this unity, but perhaps not in the same uh, manner or use the same kind of methodology to achieve this unity. Uh, for example, we have seen that Mazzini would have been happy with a republic. Gioberti suggested a federation, but there were others who had visualized a uh, united Italy as an extension of the domination of the House of Savoy in Piedmont, Sardinia. Cavour had already returned and was articulating his views through Il Risorgimento, the journal that he started publishing. An eminent historian of uh, Italy, Dennis Max Smith, felt that as 1848 had shown, Italians were still hopelessly divided. The regions, the localities uh, were more important and appealed uh, immediately to the people than a feeling of Italy as a nation. There had also been the conflicts amongst those who had looked for uh, unity. For example, Massini's uh, republicanism was uh, to find rivalries in the supporters of the old dynasties. The moderates and the radicals were in conflict. It had been seen that the peasant masses were still hopelessly illiterate and showed little or no enthusiasm for the Mazzinian popular movements. The painstaking effort to prepare the people for a revolution had been undertaken, but it had not produced the desired result yet. Italy was unified under the house of Piedmont Sardinia in 1860, 61, and the process was completed by two further stages in 1866 and 1870-71. As we had noted earlier, Gramsci, the Marxist historian, had called this a passive revolution when a people instead of leading was indeed led by a state. Charles Albert, who had made a serious attempt to take on Austria in 1848-49, was hopelessly disappointed. He abdicated in favor of his son, Victor Emmanuel II, and went to Portugal on exile, where he later died. The new king made his peace with Austria and was looking to the future. He was keen to strengthen Piedmont as a power and also to build up it as a modern state as far as possible, so that Piedmont would be in a position to take on Austria. He appointed first Tazseglio till 1852 and then Cavour as his prime minister to undertake the process of developing Piedmont, making it powerful and making it ready to lead at least the extension of Piedmont Sardinia over the Austrian occupied territories in the northern part of the country. At the same time, he never really lost the loyalty of Garibaldi. Garibaldi, the romantic and 
the disciple of Mazzini believed passionately in Italian unity. Whereas Mazzini would have opted only for a republican Italy as independent and united, Garibaldi would accept unity if it came under a monarchical regime. Italy's man of destiny at this hour, it seemed, was Count Camillo Cavour. His influence during this period of the process of Italian unification was indeed very significant and his success in many ways was brilliant. While Charles Albert had introduced certain liberal reforms after 1848, Cavour found an opportunity to articulate his views. He started the journal Il Risorgimento and in this he uh, wrote articles propagating his views about how to build up Piedmont and how to go about the task of driving Austria out and extend the influence of this state. After a, a, a failed attempt, he was successfully returned as a, a member of parliament from Turin and joined uh, the Seglio's cabinet as a, a minister. He was a very important minister in the sense that he had marine, agriculture, commerce and later for some time even the finance department under his charge. Disagreement with the Seglio obliged him to leave the ministry for a while, but he was not idle. He intrigued uh, with the parliamentary uh, groups and managed to combine his supporters, namely the moderate conservatives, with a centrist and even a small group of left-wing uh, parties. Uh, this, this arrangement is known in Italian language as connubio or simply marriage. This was a marriage of convenience, no doubt. With this, he was able to come back as Dadseglio left the ministry and Cavour took over uh, in 1852 as the prime minister of Piedmont, Sardinia. However, we need to underline this that Cavour at the beginning had no idea of unifying the whole of Italy. It was the extension of Piedmont over the northern part, if possible over the central part, was what was visualized, but what was certainly the most important task was to drive Austria out of Italy. As a minister, Cavour gave particular attention to the economic development of all, uh, Piedmont which was still predominantly agriculture. The development of agriculture was necessary to bring succor to the peasant masses who obviously had been significant. Uh, there was hardly any industry in Piedmont, indeed in the whole of Italy. It was Austrian occupied Lombardy and Piedmont that had seen a very modest beginning of industrialization. Cavour uh, introduced free trade made tariff reforms and encouraged commercial activities and also industrial activities. He also paid attention to what was crucial for integrating Italy as also for communications, for transportation. This was the beginning of the railway age in Italy, particularly in Piedmont. He was also very keen to build up a powerful army and navy for he realized that the most significant task was to engage with Austria in a war. The revolutionary attempts of Mazzini did not win many supporters and uh, therefore there had to be a reconsideration of that methodology. And we see that there was a gradual shift in the uh, ideas and attitudes of many former uh, revolutionaries. Carlo Catania, for example, uh, from uh, uh, Milan, he was a former revolutionary, was still a firm believer in federalism. But what is significant is that many of the former revolutionaries now shifted their loyalty to the House of Savoy. They pinned their hope 
in Piedmont Sardinia to achieve uh, both the unity and independence of Italy. It is very uh, relevant to quote Giorgio Pallavicino. Giorgio Pallavicino was a leader of the Lombard uprising in 1821 against Austria. But what would he say now? I am quoting him. He declared that to defeat Austria, one needs cannons and soldiers. Arms are needed and not Mazzini and Pratings. Piedmont has soldiers and cannons. Therefore, I am a Piedmontese. Piedmont these days is a monarchy. Therefore, I am not a Republican." Unquote. In 1853, Mazzinian attempts were still uh, to be seen. There was uh, an attempt at an uprising in uh, Milan and it failed miserably. Another expedition to Sicily led by the socialist Carlo Piscane equally ended in a, a failure. What became important is the creation of the National Society in 1857. It probably had the indirect patronage uh, and encouragement of uh, Cavour, but it was laid by Pallavicino, but it was joined in by Daniel Manin, who led the Venetian Republic in 1848-49 the leader of the Sicilian movement in 1848-49, La Farina, and even Garibaldi, that inveterate disciple of Mazzini. A second significant question was the role of foreign affair powers. Mazzini had all along believed that Italy can do it alone. Italia Farah does say. Cavour, on the other hand, very clearly understood the need of foreign assistance if Piedmont were to take on Austria. The Piedmont was a small state as yet. It was developing, but it would have been foolhardy to take on Austria, a very strong power unaided in a contest. Then we move on to the next phase. Napoleon, we had seen earlier, had always felt that he wanted to do something for uh, Italy. He was a member of the Carbonari and had some sympathy with the problem question of nationalities. However, after the so-called Orsini plot, when Felice Orsini tried to assassinate the emperor, it, it marked a, a, a turning point of sorts. Before he perished on the scaffold, Orsini urged the French emperor to, to really do something for Italy. But nevertheless, Napoleon now seemed to take the Italian question a little more seriously and negotiations had started. He met uh, 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 Cavour in Plombier in the Vos. In, in 1859, in 1858, and finally a secret agreement came out in 1859. It said that France would help Lomb uh, Piedmont if attacked by Austria, and if Austria were defeated, then it, uh, Piedmont would be permitted to take Lombardy, Venetia, and even Romana, that is part of the uh, papal state, to form a kingdom of Upper Italy. A separate kingdom of uh, Central Italy would comprise Tuscany, Parma, Modena, Umbria and the Marches and it would be set up under Napoleon's cousin, Prince Napoleon, who would also marry the younger daughter of Victor Emmanuel II, Clotilde. The isolation of Austria at the moment after the Crimean War was convenient. Cavour had earlier uh, used the Crimean War to try and make the Italian question an international one. He was trying to create a public opinion in favor of what he believed was the Italian question. Uh, but 
while Austria's isolation was stark, there was a need for neutrality of both Russia and Britain. Russia could probably be expected to be neutral and Britain, if somewhat wary of Napoleon's ambitions, was unlikely to intervene. Cavour followed what was known as a policy of defensive provocation. He was trying to provoke Austria into making the attack so that Napoleon could come in uh, and support them. Austria uh, did walk into this. There had been some international effort to defuse the situation, but nothing really happened. Napoleon's assistance was called for and the French army moved in support of Piedmont. Indeed, in the war that followed, it was the French army which played the major role and the Piedmontese army and the Italian volunteers played only a subsidiary role. Napoleon's army and the Piedmontese army succeeded in inflicting a uh, crushing defeat on the Austrians at the battles of Magenta and Solferino. The railway lines, as we have noted earlier, helped them during the period and it seemed that uh, Austria, uh, Austria would leave Italy and Cavour's expectation of extending Piedmontese domination would be achieved. Napoleon made a Waldfass. He concluded with Austria the peace of Villa Franca in 1859. The context of the peace was twofold. On the one hand, there was a series of popular uprisings in central Italy, which were supported by liberal minded nobles and the educated classes. They overthrew the old regimes in central Italy. On the other hand, there was a renewed anxiety about a possible intervention from other European powers. Uh, in Tuscany, the Grand Duke was forced to abdicate and a provisional government came up. The same thing happened in Parma and Modena. In Umbria and the marches, the Pope was able to uh, keep his feeble control over this, but any threat uh, to the Pope would have alienated the Catholics on whose support Napoleon uh, depended. So Napoleon had uh, a problem now. In Italy, his uh, abandonment of the cause through the uh, signing of the peace of Villa Franca had been seen and condemned as a great betrayal of the Italian cause. And what was uh, uh, projected in the peace was that Piedmont would have Lombardy but not Venetia. The old rulers were, would, would return to Tuscany uh, and the other Italian duchies. The Pope would retain his uh, position as a temporal uh, uh, power, but Napoleon III as a gesture will not insist on taking Nice and Savoy, which had been promised by the peace of Plombier. It seemed that Italy's quest for unity uh, would at once again run into a cul-de-sac or dark uh, blind alley. Cavour resigned from his position as prime minister. The old rulers, however, could not return to the central Italy. The popular movement, and here I would like to underline the continuing influence of the Mazzinian method of agitation and popular insurrection. They did not return. The provisional governments continued and indeed they now called for plebiscites. And these plebiscites were organized under the influence of the national society and its members. They not only endorsed the overthrow of the existing rulers, but they voted in favor of merging with the kingdom of Piedmont. Victor uh, Emmanuel took the initiative now. Cavour was obliged to return and Napoleon by a decree took over these territories. Napoleon was also back. He agreed to the change of arrangement 
over northern and uh, central Italy, but then he insisted on taking Nice and Savoy. <clears throat> Later, a parliament in Turin endorsed the whole project. The kingdom of Upper Italy emerged in mid-1860 with Victor Emmanuel II as its first king and Cavour as its minister. With the creation of the Kingdom of Upper Italy, the limited goal that Cavour had, had indeed been achieved. Austria had been partially driven out, Lombardy had been recovered, Venetia of course still remained with Austria. The central Italian duchies and even a part of the papal dominions had opted to join the uh, kingdom of Upper Italy and to a large extent Italy was united. Then came the last phase of the story of Italian unification, which was dramatic in its culmination. Garibaldi was against the section of Nice and Savoy. He was a native of Nice. He planned an ins a, 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 a march into Nice to stop the plebiscite there. But Cavour persuaded him instead to march to Sicily. Garibaldi gathered what is known as his famous brigade of thousand red shirts and sailed for the island of Sicily. As he said, Cavour also, uh, if he did not discourage this, put a thousand obstacles to our departure. Nevertheless, he succeeded in reaching Marsala in Sicily with his volunteers, confronted a Neapolitan army of about 25,000 and it is a, a heroic saga and a stunning victory that his ragged volunteers inflicted a defeat on the Neapolitan forces. Garibaldi no doubt was helped by the peasant uh, grievances that already existed. The peasants had been in virtual revolt over the landlords who were supported by the Bourbon dynasty, the ruler of Naples and Sicily. But Garibaldi forced the Neapolitan army to evacuate the island and virtually declared himself as the dictator of Sicily. The Bourbon rulers of Naples were on the edge now and uh, they were trying to make a last ditch effort by granting a constitution and introducing liberal reforms. But it seemed that even in Naples, there had been popular uh, grievances against the Bourbon dynasty, against their misrule, and that was ready soil for Garibaldi. But the question was, should Garibaldi uh, cross the Strait of Messina and go over to Naples. Cavour was afraid that this might spoil what he had already achieved. Uh, Britain was wary of Garibaldi's activities in uh, uh, Naples might extend French influence in the Mediterranean. But France even uh, wanted Britain uh, to take a joint naval action against Garibaldi's crossing over. Britain refused, France was unwilling to take a unilateral decision and uh, Garibaldi with little more than 3,000 uh, volunteers and two steamers did cross the uh, strait of Messina and arrived in Calabria in southern Naples. He was received enthusiastically by the people who had already uh, been in a kind of rising against the Bourbon ruler of Naples. Garibaldi set, entrenched himself there. The Neapolitan forces and the king left Naples and moved farther north. Garibaldi marched towards Naples. He arrived in Naples and was very greatly and warmly received 
by the people, nearly half a million people living in that city. And it is here that the question of confrontation, question of conflict came. Cavour also now decided to act. He moved into the part of the papal states which was still under the temporal uh, control of the po Pope and uh, ruthlessly uh, dealt with the opposition there and decided to march on to march farther south. On 26th of October, finally, Garibaldi met Victor Emmanuel II and he greeted him with these words, I salute the first king of Italy. On 8th November, Garibaldi, who had been running the administration of Naples, formally handed over his possessions to the king of Italy and he went to his humble home in the island of uh, Caprera. This was indeed a magnificent gesture of self-abnication. Thus, Italian unity was finally achieved. The kingdom of Italy was emerged in 1861 with Victor Emmanuel II as the king. In 1866, Venetia was added to this kingdom when Austria was defeated in the Austro-Prussian War. Austria, as per earlier terms, handed over Venetia to Napoleon for his neutrality and Napoleon duly gave it to the Italians. In 1870, after the Franco-Prussian War, the French garrison was withdrawn from Rome and Rome was now declared the capital of the new kingdom of Italy. And indeed, the Pope's temporal authority was confined to the Vatican uh, and, and, and a very small area. This is how then Italy was unified. 